Another great performance from Adrian Newey of Red Bull, showing no signs of slowing down. A new power unit supplier in Honda, but very quickly Red Bull got on top of the management of Honda of how to get the best from them at the same time developing their car. They weren't in great shape after, say, the Bahrain Grand Prix. And indeed, Adrian was saying after Bahrain that a lot of the performance that was to come would not be from Honda, would be from his own design team and his own thoughts and concepts of how to improve the car. And that he did. People love to talk about Adrian still using the drawing board, still using the pencil. He does so for a very specific reason, and that is because he wants to be able to see the complete car. Can't think of any other technical director who would think that way or would be capable of thinking that way. But at the same time, Adrian not only on top of what he wants from the car, but also of what he wants from Honda and how they can give that performance to him. A case study on how to run a power unit program with a partner, as distinct from the way McLaren tried to run Honda. And think about this. On top of all of that, Adrian remains a true racer, unaffected by any of the fame and the glory and the money that's come with his success. Still spends a lot of time with his Lotus 49B, drives it beautifully. And of course, he has his son Harrison racing out there in Japan, and that takes a bit of time as well. Daniel Ricciardo, great racing driver, great track craft. We hoped before the Australian Grand Prix that he knew something that we didn't about his decision to leave Red Bull to go to Renault. But as it turned out, well, he just hit that drain cover off the line. And so it has been for Daniel. He is just another racing driver now in the midfield, sometimes out-qualified by Nico Hülkenberg, sometimes out-raced by Nico Hülkenberg. We think we know why he left. One, didn't want to drive alongside Max Verstappen. Two, obviously he's been paid a lot more money. The second point, no racing driver worth his salt, in my view, should even think about earning money until they've won at least one world championship. Second point, Max Verstappen. Yeah, Max is quick. He is very, very good. And for sure, Daniel had a difficult time at Red Bull. But at the same time, he had a lot of qualities and still does that were better than Max Verstappen. He is a class act when it comes to traffic. He's a class act when it comes to planning a race and reacting to situations. But we're not seeing that now at Renault, more's the shame. Yeah, I guess I've always been a little bit of a Helmut Marko fan, only because I saw him drive. I saw him drive that BRM in Formula One before he had that eye injury that took him out of motorsport in 1972. But he is a tough man. Many of the stories from young Red Bull drivers who talk about receiving a phone call at the middle of the night. Why aren't you on the pole? Ah, oh, well, I had an engine problem. I had a tire problem. Well, the mechanics did this or things didn't go right. You should be on the pole. Put the phone down. Bang. End of Red Bull contract. But we saw in 2019, in this first half, a different Helmut Marco in his decision-making process. This to the background of Albon supporters like, say, Francois Sicard of Dams, who were running Alex in Formula 2 in 2018, constantly saying to Helmut Marco, you've got to have another look at this guy. You can talk all you like about Charles Leclerc, but Alex Albon also has a wonderful touch. And on every occasion, Helmut Marco would say, no, been there, done that, not interested, not quick enough, until... Alex signed for the Nissan Formula E team. At that moment, he was on the phone again saying, I want him, I need Toro Rosso, get him out of that contract now. Well, it was a good decision because he has proved to be the find of the season. He is a very, very good racing driver and now he has his chance in the Red Bull A team. Personally, I think he'll maximize that and I think he'll probably keep it through to 2020. Pierre Gasly, of course, goes to the Toro Rosso seat that Alex has vacated. And I think he'll do well there, partly because I think he'll be a racing driver again. He'll be, of course, demoralized by having to go there. He'll be digging deep. And partly because I think he'll be the driver that he was when he was doing GP2 and then Super Formula in Japan when he excelled in the wet at circuits like Suzuka. There's talk, with emphasis on the word talk, of a $175 million budget cap. But for the top three teams, I'm sure this will be something that they will just accept and then carry on as normal. Very easy for them to continue to funnel funds through their engine program and through a variety of different sources as well, as we've talked about many times. So they'll still be up in the 250, 200, even 300 million region. As for the other teams, 175 is probably a pretty good number because I'd be surprised if many of them exceed that anyway. So will anything change? I very much doubt it. 2021, in theory, we're going to have an all new car. To my mind, the changes need to be bigger than that. We need to be doing more in terms of introducing more proprietary parts, even customer cars on a limited basis and making engine power units much more affordable and available for new teams to come into Formula One and to operate to new 21st century cost saving standards. Two Brits will undoubtedly go on to win Grand Prix in the medium term. 
Very different 2019 so far, of course. Lando Norris driving for McLaren, George Russell driving for Williams. One in the high midfield, one right at the back of the pack. But there's no difference between the quality of their driving, in my view. Lando has maximized his opportunities. Carlos Sainz still that very reactive, creative, acrobatic, reflexy driver, particularly in the wet. Lando against that, showing how he can manipulate the dynamic weight of the car in such a way as to make it look very composed and very, very stable. That's why he's done so well in qualifying. Meanwhile, George Russell on the limit, very, very consistent, beautiful to watch in the Williams, even if they are two or three seconds off the pace. Great to see how Charles Leclerc has developed in the 2019 season. He's right up there, I think, with Max Verstappen as one of the two key drivers of the next generation. And fascinating, too, to see the effect he's had on Sebastian Vettel and Ferrari. I think most of the reason Ferrari have not been super competitive this year and haven't won a race and aren't vying for the championship in the way that we thought perhaps they will is because of the pace of Charles Leclerc and how that has unbalanced the team and how that's unbalanced Sebastian Vettel's view of himself and of the way he goes about doing the job of a racing driver and as the key player in the team. They're discombobulated on the pit wall at Ferrari, generally speaking, and they have an approximate feel of where they want to go, but nothing in detail. That's because Charles Leclerc is there confusing the mind of Sebastian Vettel. And so long as that goes on, it will be very, very difficult for Ferrari to find the direction, the sense of direction they need, not only for the car, but for the way they run the car. Lewis Hamilton just gets better and better all the time, despite all those wins, despite the World Championships. And that's because he simplifies his approach to racing, I think, in two ways. He has a very clear picture of what he wants from the car, how to get that from the team around him, and to keep everything else out of his mind, and to keep things simple. Beyond that, he's very able to switch off between races. He has another life. He's a real human being. One of the few real human beings, I think, in the Formula One paddock. Doesn't matter what he actually does. The point is he loves doing those other things. And it's also the point that when he comes back into racing, he's able to switch on again, refreshed, and go motor racing as the racing driver that he's always been. He doesn't get over-involved with the data. He doesn't get over-involved with the discussions. He doesn't get over-involved with all the communication that could take place between races. He's very disciplined about that. And that is the reason that he's still motivated, still hungry, and still improving day by day. Max Verstappen, along with Charles Leclerc, the next superstar in Formula One, very, very similar to Lewis Hamilton in the way he drives, very similar to Lewis in his approach to racing. He simplifies the job, he focuses on what's important, keeps all the crud away from him. And I think that was never better exemplified than in his first year in Formula One, when he had that massive shunt going into Sander Vaud at Monaco, when brake tested effectively by Romain Grosjean, hit the back of Grosjean, big accident. Monday morning, all he wanted to do was get to the Genk cart track in Belgium and just do a million laps in a shifter cart in the rain just to get his feel back again, just to make sure he was the racing driver that he knew he could be. That's what Max Verstappen is all about. We have the orange grandstands now. We have the huge momentum that is coming with him from a different sector of Europe. And of course, we have an upcoming Dutch Grand Prix. All of that is great. The interesting thing is that Max isn't being affected by any of it. Red Bull, Honda, Adrian Newey, Max Verstappen, Yep, you can smell several world championships ahead. A lot of credit due to Toto Wolff in the first half of 2019 because Mercedes is so big and yet they are a very personal team and you can tell that this is all because of very good man management at the top. The management level below Toto, whether it be creative, whether it be logistics, whether it be technical, whether it be strategic, whether it be media, whether it be any of these things, you can feel that the people involved, the key people involved, not only have the ability to think freely, but also to take risks if they feel risks need to be taken. It's all about communication, of course. It's all about getting the best from people. And it's a pleasure to see somebody at the top of a company as big as Mercedes able to engender this from his staff. It's very easy in Formula One to become autocratic, to shout and scream and to get things the way you want them to be. I get the feeling that Toto does listen to people and that's one of the reasons that Mercedes are as good as they are today. Yeah, Valtteri Bottas, a very good foil to Lewis Hamilton, quick enough perhaps to win on the day, but not enough to give Lewis a hard time over the course of the championship. Will Toto make the decision that he needs a faster driver in the other car, in which case go for Esteban Ocon, a talent that we all want to see back into Formula One as soon as possible? 
or will he keep the status quo? It'll be interesting to watch how his mindset develops, Toto's that is, as the season winds down.